Income Tax 2023-2024, Section 179 Deduction Software Example. Get ready and some coffee so we can stave off the government attack with income tax preparation. Okay, maybe we won't be able to stave them off completely, but we'll, we'll slow them down. Here we are in our... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Perform 1040 example problem using LACERT tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, great tool to run scenarios with. You can also find access to the forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, Adam Taxman, just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in Beverly Hills, 90210, single filer, no dependents, starting with the Schedule C income, rolling into line 8, let's follow that flow through, we're going to the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, has an income statement format, Income minus expenses. Income starting at 120000 Expense of the 20000 gives us the net income of the 100000 That flows into the Schedule 1. Additional income and adjustments to income. Part number 1, additional income. There's the 100000 which flows ultimately to the Form 1040. Line number 8. Additional income from Schedule 1, there's the 100000 Also, the Schedule C, bottom line, the 100000 rolls into the Schedule SE, which is the self-employment tax, basically Social Security and Medicare, kind of the payroll taxes equivalent for the self-employed, coming out to 14129 That flows to the Schedule 2, additional taxes, part number 2, line 4, self-employment tax, there's the 14129 which ultimately flows into the Form 1040, page number 2, there it is, line 23, other taxes, including self-employment tax. Also, if we go to the Schedule C, we could see that 100000 flowing into the Schedule SE, self-employment tax, where we calculated Social Security and Medicare, 14129 half of that, 7065 and above the line deduction on Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income, page 2, adjustments to income in part 2, line 15, a uh, deductible part of self-employment tax. There's that 7065 rolling into the form 1040, line number 10, adjustments to income from Schedule 1. So we have the 100,000 minus the above the line deduction or adjustment to income gives us the adjusted gross income, 92,935. We have the standard deduction or itemized deduction here taking the standard. We've got the qualified business income deduction coming from 8,995. Here's our worksheet for that, 15,817. Taxable income, 63,268. Page two, calculating the tax. Federal income tax, 9228 and then that self-employment tax that rolled in is the 14129 giving us total tax to start out with, 23357 All right, let's go back to page one. We're clearly focusing in on the Schedule C. Let's go to the Schedule C. We're looking at the expense side of things, and we're concentrating on the depreciation more specifically, the 179 deduction. Now, quick recap of depreciation in general. 
you will recall that something with we think about depreciation even if we're on a cash based system the irs will require us to do accrual things sometimes such as with property plant and equipment they're basically following generally accepted accounting principles normal accounting concepts because the point in time that we purchase the equipment is significantly different than the time that we use the equipment and therefore instead of just expensing it as equipment expense we have to put it on the books as an asset now you might say well how do i do that because this schedule c only has an income statement no balance sheet how do i put it on the books as an asset which is a balance sheet account well we can use a separate schedule which is just basically a depreciation schedule so basically we're given kind of parts of the balance sheet that are going to be necessary to supplement the information that is on the income statement side of things, which is basically the Schedule C. Now, if you put a piece of equipment on the books uh, and we're going to depreciate it in normal accounting concepts, you would say, all right, if it was a 10,000 piece of equipment, I'm going to put it on the books as an asset. And then if I'm going to use it for 10 years, maybe I use straight line depreciation, dividing the 10,000 by 10 years, depreciating each year 1,000. So in the current year, possibly if we got the full year of depreciation, maybe we would be able to deduct the 1,000 in that concept. However, you can also think, well, maybe it would be more beneficial for us to take and fair from an accounting standpoint to take more of the depreciation up front. And we call that an accelerated depreciation method. It's still a legitimate accounting concept, the most common being a double declining balance. When we use maker's depreciation, that's basically a form of double declining balance usually. Uh, and then we have this situation where the IRS has special depreciation and 179. That's what we're focusing on this time, which doesn't line up very well to normal accounting concepts. This is something that the that the government is doing because of politics, lobbying, you know, they're trying to do giveaways to to to, you know, get favor and whatnot and all that kind of stuff. So they allow more depreciation up front with this 179 deduction, which means that we could end up with a situation where, for example, I could have deducted the $10,000 up front, but no, you told me I had to put it on the books as an asset. So I put it on the books as an asset. And then you said that I had to, uh, I could get a 179 deduction, which means I got to depreciate the whole thing again. So why didn't you just let me depreciate the whole thing or deduct it in the first place? And obviously, again, it comes down to this complexity with the laws changing over time. They did something that makes sense from an accrual standpoint, and then they deviated from that for po political standpoints. All right, and there's also going to be some interplay between the 179 deduction and possibly like special depreciation or bonus depreciations and so on, which we'll talk about uh, in future presentations. So let's imagine, for example, we had that 10,000 piece of equipment. So if I go back on over here on the Schedule C, you might say if I didn't capitalize it, it would be down, it would be in here somewhere and possibly it would be hiding under something uh, like supplies or something like that, right? So I might have in supplies $10,000. And so, uh, hold on a second, it's not, it's not doing it. $10,000 in supplies, okay? So if I go back on over, there's the 10,000. Now, if we have a substantial amount in supplies, that is very high compared to other businesses in our industry or very high compared to our revenue, the IRS might look at that and see a red flag if they're just doing like ratio analysis, right? Because that's where things would be buried if we didn't capitalize things, but rather took the whole expense up front. Now let's imagine, okay, we can't do it that way. So that obviously reduced my net income and say, well, they won't let me do that because we need to do the depreciation thing, putting it on the books as an asset. So we have, okay, they, we can't do that. We're going to take it out of supplies because this is a depreciable property and I'm going to put it on the books uh, as an asset. So we're going to say, I'm just going to call it uh, uh, PPE1, just a generic equipment. You clearly want to be as specific as possible in real life. 
because you want to be able to make sure 10 years down the road, you can actually look at these depreciation schedules and tie them into a specific piece of property, which might be sold separately. Uh, otherwise, you're going you're gonna to run into problems as you grow your schedules here. But in any case, we're going to say it's going to be, let's just call it uh, machinery and equipment. We'll talk more about these categories possibly later. Uh, the date placed in service, let's say it was 03, 01, uh, two, uh, two, three, that we placed it in service. So kind of, uh, uh, two, three, what am I talking about? We're, we're going to say, no, that's right. And then I'm going to say the cost is 10,000. And let's start off by saying that we're not going to have any 179 deduction that we're going to be allocating to it. And let's also start off without any special depreciation. And then I'm also going to call it the type of property I'm going to say is makers five year uh, property, and it's not going to be subject to the auto limitations. We'll talk about makers more later, but let's just take a look at that now. That would be, we don't have any of these upfront uh, depreciations, the 179 or special. You can see 2000 flowing into the depreciation and we don't have a balance sheet, but we do have depreciation schedules. And on the depreciation schedule, we can see that we have the 10,000. That's going to be our original cost or basis. And then over here, it's calculating 200 DB stands for double declining half year convention. So basically what it did is it took the 10,000. And if I was to take the double declining balance, you could say divided by five years would be 2000. And then if I divide that by the 10,000, you're going to get a 0.2. That would be that would be the straight line rate if i double it times two we get to 0.4 so 0.4 is the double declining rate times ten thousand that's going to be four thousand for an entire year but we bought it in uh march and we assume that we bought it in the middle of the year that's the half year convention divided by two so that's the two thousand now that actually comes out to the straight line rate because of the half year convention but it's not a straight line rate because you can see that if you go to like year two that it's not it's not doing exactly a straight line uh situation here so we'll talk more about that uh when we get to makers but that's the general concept for regular depreciation now if i didn't put anything in this particular software for 179 to claim it and i didn't say to suppress the special depreciation by default this software will then calculate uh, the special depreciation. So now you have the 10,000 minus the 8,000. This was an upfront basically kind of depreciation taken, which reduces the basis down to 2,000. And we have the current depreciation of 400. So that, uh, 8, 000, that 400 and the 8,000, if I go to the schedule C, is now pulling in. So you can see that's substantially larger We'll talk about special and bonus types of depreciations possibly in future presentations, but you can see the same concept is applying as basically the 179, uh, which is another format that we might be able to use to take the depreciation basically up front. So now instead of doing that, let's say that we take the 179 deduction instead. So now I'm going to say that we're going to take the 179 deduction of 10 thousand so i'm going to try to do the whole thing and go back on over and now we've got the whole ten thousand being taken if i go to the depreciation schedules now i'm going to say the regular depreciation now we've got the cost or basis the current 179 uh bonus the ten thousand which brings the basis down to zero so in essence we expensed it or wrote it off on a cash based system basically which br brings us back to the same bottom line in essence that we had if I just had included it in like equipment expense or when I dumped it into supplies. So that's where it gets a little bit confusing because you might say, well, what is the point of that? But obviously the point is that, that it started out as using normal accounting concepts and then they did this upfront stuff. And then of course there's going to be limits to the, to the 179 deduction uh, in terms of what, what property can be applied to a 179 deduction and the dollar limit, how high that dollar limit will go, which is fairly substantial for many small 
sole proprietorships, which means for like small businesses, you might be able to basically write off things as you purchased them because of these upfront deductions. But these are also the deductions that are likely to change over time because they don't coincide with, you know, generally accepted accountant principles. All right, so the next thing that could happen is we could have this piece of equipment on the books, but we don't use it exclusively for business. We have some personal and some business use. This is most common to happen with an automobile, but we have added complications due to the limitations related to automobiles. So we might take a look at that kind of separately. Let's first just look at it this way. And so let's imagine that we use it mostly for business. So we use it like 70% uh, business, right? So we're going to say, okay, percent 0.7 on the business side. And then we jump back over. We're going to say, all right, so here it is. We put it on the books, $10,000. And then there's the 70% that's being taken. And therefore, 7,000 of it is subject to the 179 because all of it is subject going to be subject to the 179 that's business related none of it is no longer de is depreciable now because the 3000 is personal use and therefore not deductible so we've deducted everything that we can that was on the business side which is flowing through to the schedule c so there we have that but if we were to take the business use below 50 percent to like point three on the business side of things then we can go back on over and say okay what happens if i go to my software and say what is happening now so now we have uh hold on that's amt we have the cost 30 percent was uh business related no longer allowed us to take the 179 deduction because it dropped under the 50%, still allowing us to take part of the special depreciation allowance of the 2,400, which we'll talk about later. So the point is, if you drop below 50% on the business use, it could result in not being able to take the 179 deduction. One other little glitch about that is that if it was over the 50% in the first year, and you took the 179 deduction and then it dropped under the 50% in the following year, you have a situation where you might need to like recapture the 179 deduction, which is somewhat of a rare situation, but something to keep in mind. Now the dollar limitations are usually fairly high for a sole proprietor. So we have the ability to go up to 1,160,000 typically. So just to show you that, let's increase our income a bit over here on the schedule c let's bring it on up to like 10 million dollar oh, that's 100 million let's go to 10 let's not get too crazy i mean for crying out loud so then we're gonna say all right let's go to our deductions for the depreciation and let's imagine that the cost of our property now was uh two million five hundred thousand or let's just say let's just say it was one million five hundred thousand and so we want to try to take the whole thing one million five hundred thousand up front and just basically expense it in the form of a 179 deduction so if i go then to the forms we're going to say okay let's go to the schedule c and you can see here that it's limited us a bit one million four hundred forty five six let's see the calculation on the depreciation schedules regular depreciation so there's the 1,500,000 the 179 1,160,000 and then it's still combining those the 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 179 and the special depreciation which depreciation which is having kind of that overlap so even though we were limited here we're still getting a significant amount from the special depreciation which brings the depreciation basis after those upfront depreciation is to 68,000, which it then uses the double declining balance method, uh, which is also accelerated on the 68,000 to get the 13,600. So we still get quite a substantial amount of uh, the depreciation that we're pulling in uh, to our, our forms. But we see that dollar six limitation on the 179 will look more at special depreciation in makers later. Now, just in, if you do, if you were to run into that situation, 
and you had multiple pieces of equipment, obviously we might not just have one piece of equipment, we might have bought, bought a bunch of stuff during the year that we have to capitalize that are going over that limit of the 1,160,000. So if I add another piece of equipment and I call it uh, PPE2, and I'm gonna say duh, 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 this is gonna be category three, let's say we put this on the book, it's 060123, and let's say that this one cost uh, 700,000 and the method this time, let's say this is actually not a five year, but is a three year, uh, three year straight line makers. Now, so then the question is, well, which of these properties do I want to apply the 179 uh, deduction? Because I could apply it to, if I applied to both of them, it's gonna hit the cap on it. And you might say, well, it doesn't really matter, but it could matter because I, if I'd like to max out in this case, the top one, because that one will give me, because this, this depreciation basis is five years, or let's actually make this a longer depreciation base. So it's a five year, let's say this one is seven year property. So now I could, I could, apply it all to the first one and then none of none of the 179 would be applied to the second one here right so if i put 70,000 here let's just see what the software how it's going to apply it i tried to max out it on both if i go to the worksheet then we're going to say then the 179 was all applied to the first piece of equipment uh, bringing the depreciation basis down as low as it could and then the second piece of equipment didn't have any 179 deduction, but still I let the software calculate the special depreciation, which also kind of adds a little complication into the mixture here. And so there is that one. However, it, if it was just the 179 deduction we're looking at, we'd say, I would like to get more uh, of the depreciation allocated to, to this one up front because the, the stuff that doesn't get depreciated, I'm gonna have to take over a longer useful life is what I'm trying to point out here. So in other words, it might be, if I'm trying to get the depreciation as soon as possible, I might wanna take the full 700,000 here first and then allocate the rest uh, up top, which would be the, which would be the cap of the 1,160,000 thousand minus the seven hundred thousand which is going to give us that four hundred and sixty thousand so up here we do the four hundred and sixty thousand and by doing that possibly i'm able to take take this one off off completely and depreciate it all up front rather than taking any remainder which i would have to depreciate over a longer useful life whereas this one I, I'm still going to be limited to the amount that I can depreciate up front, but the remainder is only going to be depreciated over five years as opposed to seven years. So you can get into complex situations. That's often the case with depreciation. We're, we're going to be thinking, if I have to put it on the books as an asset, how could I get the depreciation sooner rather than later? That's the general rule. There are times when maybe you want to take it later because of Maybe you think you're gonna have a higher income later and be in a higher tax bracket, but the default rule would be, all right, what's what's the way I can put this together so I can get more depreciation upfront and depreciate it over a shorter lifetime, have more accelerated depreciation upfront is generally the idea. So now the current 179 is being allocated. The whole 700,000 has been wiped out for the seven year property, which means we're not gonna to have to depreciate any of it over seven years. Whereas this one, after the current and special, we still have 208,000, which I don't get in the current year, but I, I only have to depreciate it over five years as opposed to seven years. So that would be preferable than having to depreciate it over seven years is the general idea I'm trying to get at. All right, so the other strange thing to note is that if you actually have a whole lot of property you put on the books, then if you go over the 2,890,000, it's going to lim limit the amount of 179 deduction you can take. So then let's go back to our first example and say, okay, let's, let's delete this one. Oh, I added, I wanted to delete it. Delete that one. 
and let's say this one's on the books once again for the one million five, and let's try to take the whole thing one million five hundred thousand, and I can go back on over, and it's going to take the cap of one million one hundred and sixty thousand. But what if I put this up to three million? Three million. Is that right? Yes. And I tried to I tried to take one seventy nine for the whole thing. And I go back on over and say, okay, what is it going to do there? It's it's only going to allow me one hundred and five thousand, because the amount that went over this limit of two million eight hundred and ninety actually reduced the maximum amount of one seventy nine deduction that I could take. So when we're if you're thinking about purchasing property, of course, how would this affect decision making for like larger businesses or businesses that are buying that? volume of of uh, of equipment they want to be careful about that range of going over the the two million eight hundred and ninety which could limit you know the amount of 179 deduction that could be taken so that's kind of weird because you have like the dollar limit and then if you buy too much property you actually reduce the dollar limit that could be taken for the 179. now the other thing that becomes uh a problem sometimes is if this equipment, let's bring this down back down to like 100,000 and 100,000, but let's say it was a, a car, but let's say with the car, we, we end up with these auto limits that could apply. And then we also end up with car or trucks under the 600 pound with the limits apply. And then we have the uh, vehicles over 600 pounds with no limits. So these this all comes into play because of, of the situations with the automobiles and the IRS being kind of skeptical of over depreciating automobiles and say SUVs, for example. So let's say that the, that the auto limits apply here. So I'm gonna say it's five year uh, truck over uh, under 600 pounds, auto limits apply. 6,000 pounds that is so okay so if I go back on over we'll just and we we'll, might take a look at this more in future presentations but just as uh, the general concept let's look at the regular depreciation we have the cost and then the current 179 is now capped at that 20,200 bringing the depreciable basis to the 79,800 uh, all right, now we also have an issue with with limitations on our income. So let's go back on over and let's say, let's bring it back to five years, uh, just straight line without the auto limitations. And then let's say that the property on the books was 200,000, 200,000. And let's bring our income back down, back down to reality, 120,000 minus 20,000, which is the 100. So now I don't have enough income to take the 179 deduction. So if I go to my Schedule C, then I'm back to the 120 minus the 20, and then it only allowed me the 100,000 because that brings my income to zero, even though I tried to write off 200,000 of the 179 deduction. If I go to my depreciation schedules over here, we can say, okay, we put it on the books for 200,000. We've got the 200,000 over here. So then the question is, well, wait a second, you only allowed me to take 100,000. So what's the deal? Because you would think that if I don't get the other 200,000, I should get some benefit from it some other way. Either you would think that the, the 100,000 basis would be calculated and I can depreciate the rest of it using the double declining method. I should, let me bring this back to double declining. That's what my default position is. I put it under straight line here. Let's say it was maker's uh, five-year normal double declining, right? Is not that's what I wanted. All right, it would, but no, that's not what happened. You actually get a, a more of a benefit, <clears throat> which would be that you can roll forward the 179 to the next year. So instead of depreciation, the rest of it using the normal maker's double declining balance over five years, you might be able to get the other hundred thousand next year as the 179 deduction rolls forward from year to year, which is really important to note in terms of software. It's quite nice to be using the same software from year to year to help to pick up 
those uh, carry forwards and rollovers. Let's take a look at the form uh, 4562. We have the depreciation uh, and <clears throat> amortization part number one, which is the election to expense certain property under the 179. So once again, the maximum amount is at that 1160 The total 179 we have is that 200000 This uh, is that upper limit that if we go over the maximum phases out of that 2890 so we've we've got the property on the books for the 200,000 there's the 200,000 but our income is limited by 100,000 therefore we only get 100 of the 200 I'm kind of recapping the discussion here right and that's going to give us our carryover of disallowed deduction to, to 2024 of uh, the 100,000. So that's the general idea. For many small businesses, it's kind of straightforward oftentimes because you might basically not hit this cap and therefore in essence be able to deduct it but properly put it on the books as an asset and then basically uh, take the deduction in the form of an upfront front 179 deduction. But if you get into the higher uh, income levels and therefore higher property, plants, and equipment, we've got to be careful with regards to these limits and how we're going to be allocating the 179 deduction out between different uh, assets. Also, how it interplays with the other deductions like the special depreciation, which we'll talk about later, and the maker's uh, depreciation if we need to choose pick and choose which of the depreciable assets we get the benefit from. Normally, the idea is we want to take the deduction if we can sooner rather than later but remember there are situations where that might not be the case <clears throat> if i think that next year for example my income is going to be much higher because of the progressive tax system then i'm going to have higher tax rates next year therefore in some cases you might say i would rather take the deductions later where they're going to be impacting higher tax rates and possibly give me more of a benefit so you could imagine situations where that where that could be uh the case as well and then the other kind of sticky situation with this 179 deduction for many small businesses is what happens when the auto gets into play for example because i might use it partially for personal use versus business use you might have auto limitations that apply that we might talk more about later and you could have uh, situations where it's you know personal versus business use how much of it is personal how much of it is for business use and you could have the question as to whether i should take the actual uh auto expenses which includes depreciation or use a mileage method which is typically more si more simplified and takes into consideration like depreciation within that calculation which would mean that you don't do the depreciation calculation but rather the mileage method <clears throat> 